There it is. You got I, me? I got you loud and clear. Woo! How you doing, bud? I'm all right. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much. And uh, We made it. We did it. We did it through the magic of technology. Um, <coughs> and what a great thing and, and uh, good timing, too. Can you hear me all right? Do I need to make it up, down, anything? No, you're perfect. All right. Let's turn you up a tiny bit there on the board um and uh so exciting stuff so we'll just we'll jump into it so we can max your time first and foremost uh a big aloha mahalo and i can't believe we get you back you believe it pat you were last on with us it was june of 2021 i don't believe that much time yikes I know. wow time went by fast huh? <laughs> real fast uh, it goes goes by fast when you're sitting at home <laughs> with nothing to do <laughs> well that hasn't been your case you got uh obviously a couple big shows coming up but you and you and tommy boy uh wrote the uh long train running uh our story of the doobie brothers that came out uh the liberté am i pronouncing that properly uh yep that's it liberté and uh so see stuff happened i mean there's a lot that happened that was october 2021 uh, then the record version, the el the uh, vinyl version, if you will, last year. And so how long, fill us in, have you been back on the Valley Isle since everything? Oh, gosh, let's see. We did a, a tour last, started out, I think, last May, something like that. <clears throat> and we kind of toured all spring, summer, fall. And we did a ton of shows, um, went all over the country. Um, and uh, Mike McDonald was part of that. It was our our extended 50th anniversary, uh, which we had planned to do in 2020. And then the pandemic hit, so we postponed it for a year. And then the pandemic was still raging, so we kind of waited a little bit. And then we finally hit the road. Um, and uh, we, were, we did some shows. I think at the end of 2020, we did a few shows for about you know three weeks, three and a half weeks, something like that. And then um, last year, we did just a ton of shows, I don't know, 80, 90 shows, maybe right. something like that, um, all over the country. And uh, that was, you know, again, the 50th anniversary of 52 years by that point. Um, and that was really great fun. And we got a chance to play some of the new music that we had released on the Liberté album. And then we released our book sh shortly before that. And so it was kind of a concept, I think, was just to have some stuff to talk about, you know, the book and the and the record and then the tour as well. Um, oh, and then we did get nominated. I think we actually, maybe last time I talked to you, we had already been inducted right, into call. the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So that was kind of another talking point we had. Um, and uh, still, you know... <laughs> still living the dream on that one yeah um, <laughs> i was gonna say it's a, a forever talking point <laughs> yeah yeah pretty cool so uh and then we're back uh let's see we we toured up through november of this year uh, or of 2022 and then uh, we've been home pretty much we did one date in december and one date in january and uh, now we're waiting till uh, May, we're going to do some rehearsals, and then we're going overseas um, uh, to play in Australia, Japan. Singapore. Uh, one, one show in Singapore, and then coming back and playing here in the islands yep. on the way back. Now, it looks huge, uh, and, and that's a, a bunch of... Uh, hey, you guys, what's your audience like in that part of the world, anyway? Uh, you know, in Australia and Japan, uh, probably it would be, you know, same kind of uh, thing that we have here in the States. You know, every people from 9 to 90 kind of thing. So you have <laughs> yeah. a base of fans there in like Japan, for instance. What are the size of the venues? Y yeah. Are they arenas? Uh, it, or? It, vary, it varies. I think we're playing the Budokan. Okay. And that's a big one. Um, I don't know what's that, eight? 10, I don't, something like 000. that yeah it's like a mini a something mini like arena that. kind of deal historic uh but most of them i would say that we're playing over there probably around you know two three thousand twenty five hundred three thousand got it seats and we're doing uh, you know some multiple nights in a couple of places 
I think, or maybe just one place. I think we're doing two nights somewhere. Um, but it's kind of a quick one. I think we'll only be over there about ooh, two and a half weeks or something. I, I haven't <laughs> really, I haven't looked at the total schedule because I, you know, I don't, I don't really pay as much attention to what it gets there because it changes so much, you know, that I look at it cursory, you know, and then I sure. kind of back off and wait, wait for it to, to lock in. Um, but, um, you know, it, all, all in all, it'll probably be, you know, a month of between Australia and Singapore, Australia, Japan. And then wrap it up here. And, uh, and then wrap it up here at home, yeah. Final one will be at the Waikiki Shell. Now, in the, the number of years I've been seeing you guys here, it's always been over at the arena. So that's going to be an interesting um, one for Honolulu folks. And I know you've done the shell. In fact, in doing some homework for today's little chit-chat, I know that you filmed your 1990, I believe, concert video that was done. We did a concert video there. Yeah, 1990, which is... Uh, Kind of interesting because my wife was uh, pregnant with my son at the time, <laughs> and she was, he was born, you know, I, I, six months later, or something maybe less, wow. less. <laughs> so uh, that was, you know, like memorable. <laughs> yeah, no, and when you watch that video, you can see the uh, the architecture of the shell is quite distinctive uh, in in the background of that, and. Uh, and that's great. Now, I was putting together a, um, we had uh, Steve the Mystery emailer, who you may or may not have heard, because Pat actually, being on Maui, listens to the show sometimes. And uh, Steve sometimes gives us little tidbits, as you know, about band's history. And yep. he, he had heard you, uh, he was talking, he said, he was talking about when you were on that last time. I enjoyed listening to your interview with Pat. He mentioned they once did a tour with the Memphis Horns. I checked my files, found the following information you might find interesting. It was May 24th, 1975, Steve writes, that the Doobies played before a sold-out crowd at the Blaisdell Arena. It had you, it had Skunk on, Jeff Skunk Baxter on guitars, Tieran Porter, bass guitar, Billy Payne from Little Feet on keys, John Hartman, Keith Knudsen, and the Memphis Horns ticket prices. What a bargain! Seven fifty, six fifty, five fifty. Yeah, <laughs> that was big money in those days. Oh, I'm <laughs> sure it was. Tom didn't play at that concert. He was ill. Any memories of that? Does anything stick out? Uh, I do remember it. Uh, um, I think it was the first time we'd ever uh, played in Hawaii with the Memphis Horns. Uh, we they, we toured with those guys a from lot. around that time period, probably right. for the next. I don't know, let's see, 75, at least seven more years they yeah. were with us uh, out on the road. Um, and just, you know, can't say enough good about them. They were just no. a fabulous. You told uh, great stories about that, about them. And, uh, yeah, and David Gass. They were fantastic. How, oh how, God! David, how David he had gets. hooked you guys up with them, and uh, what was the uh, when you did that Blaisdell? I guess when when I was writing this, I remembered that when you did that 2003 show with Isaac Hayes, Shaka Khan, Martha Reeves, you guys. I guess because I asked you, and I'm remembering, you didn't get a lot of time with each other because you were kind of busy doing your own things. Is that how it went? You didn't get to hang with Isaac, or did you do anything with him that night? Oh no, I saw. I didn't. We didn't hang so much as just you know walked up hey how, how are you doing and you know um but we were all able to greet each other and, and see each other we uh we had done stuff for david in the past yeah. you know, he was one of those crazy entrepreneurs that uh, <laughs> he liked to get, you know get people together and he, the fact that he um did work for uh willie mitchell who was a brand high records down there in, in uh memphis it was Al Green's label, right. and gosh, a bunch, you know, a um, bunch of different people. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> little, little Johnny Taylor, a bu bunch of artists. Um, and uh, so we, he ended up all, with a lot of those Memphis musicians were on that show, Isaac Hayes being one of them. And uh, Isaac, uh, we had done some shows uh, together in the past. So uh, not together, but, you know, on the same bill. On the same bill. And... Uh, yeah, similar kind of things with David. Uh, David's gig, probably. Uh, nobody ever got paid. It was a char charitable kind of a, a show. Probably, uh, probably uh, 
David, it's probably a charity for David. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say. Nah, some of the some of the money went to uh, you know some charitable organization. I don't know how much, but that's a good one. But they were great, great shows. You know, in fact, that uh, you would see musicians playing together that you would probably never normally see uh, on the same bill. Um, an example: Isaac Hayes and the Doobie Brothers, kind of yeah. unusual pairing. Uh, but uh, God, there was you know um, Martha and the Vandellas. Uh, I can't even remember. There were so many acts. I don't know if you have a list of some well, of them. Well, I actually, it's so funny. I have a. Uh, this is not a David Guest specific one, and certainly last time, folks can always arc, go in our archives, take a listen to Pat's hysterical stories about having to testify <laughs> with Al Green. <laughs> I mean, just some really, oh, yeah. <laughs> really, uh, and Sam and Dave and stuff. And, and, and he draws a lot of the connections with, uh, Willie Mitchell and so forth. But anyway, I did this thing. I was going to do this bit with you and we'll do it in honor of Steve, the mystery <laughs> emailer. I'm sure he'll enjoy this. So I, I spent some time, uh, with, uh, Patty boy looking up the stuff from you. So I did this classic poster flashback, storytelling session we're going to try so i have this roughly in chronological order and you'll see if there's any and we can just go to the next one if none of them have stories but i'm hoping a few of them might might uh start you out so september 1972 it says here's a great poster for this one from your first national tour new york academy of music the bill was according to this bill the headliner was t-rex middle act was argent and the opener the doobie brothers Oh my God! Um, no, I told we did a whole tour with uh, Mark Boland right. and T Rex, and that was part of that tour. Um, and we had done a bunch of shows all over. I think we started out up in Canada and kind of worked our way down. So it was probably one of the somewhat earlier shows uh, that we did. Um, but uh, you know. What was the venue again? The, the this was Academy the uh, of, of Music, yeah, New York Academy. Academy and it could be, of Music. It could be any story you've got from that tour, actually, because you're right. It was a whole tour. I just happened to see a poster that's sort of a representative. I guess when I bring it up, it's a representative of that era. So when I say that, is there a Mark Bolin <laughs> or a uh, story or fun time? Because he was such a – talk about – when you talk about uh, tours that bring together artists that are somewhat different, That that's sort of one. We – you know, we, um, like I say, we started out, uh, gosh, I think up in uh, Vancouver or Toronto, something like that, up in Canada with him. And uh, I had never seen him before. I heard a few of his tunes and I thought, gosh, what, what is this music? It's strange. You know, it's really retro kind of what, you know, it's, and, and I'd seen pictures. I know what, is he wearing? You know, what is going on here? You know, because it was kind of before glitter rock yeah in, in, in a certain sense uh, he started the, the the craze you know right. um between you know really I, I look at him you know mott the hoople was you know soon after that maybe but but really mark bolin was the first guy to wear a really you know spangly granny takes a trip uh suits and you know sh you know they were sequins everywhere you know they were glow in the dark platform shoes you know i'd never seen platform shoes here's this guy wearing these you know three inch platform shoes which was probably not even that high for that right. later on they got you know four inches five inches <laughs> but he's wearing these shoes you know i'm going what is happening and you know, he had makeup and he had uh you know eyeliner that was glitter and just you know is he gay i don't know i can't what's happening no he you know he's married he's got kids you know he's like he's just this he's a superstar you know and when he we played and we're like okay we're leather jackets <laughs> jeans cowboy boots you know <laughs> and um so we're out there playing and uh, people are kind of listening in there i think we had it was the first uh, time we we had this song uh, listen to the music mm. and it was just out had just been kind of out getting a little bit of play on radio and so you know we'd play and people would go eh. and we play this, listen to the music and they'd go oh it's those guys yay right listen to, we of course wait till the end we'd play our hit and that was the end of the show <clears throat> but we kind of got up on stage we just stand there and play you know and, 
not do anything. You know? And uh, so Mark comes out and he, you know, he is strutting up and down the stage and he's got this guitar that's really funny, crazy shape, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, he's on fire and the audience is going crazy. And I'm thinking, is this really that good? Is that music? You know, it's like he, he didn't really play lead guitar or what he played was like, and that was kind of it. That was his lead. But everything else was like, and then he's got a funny band. He's got this guy banging on conga drums. You can't even, <laughs> you can't even hear him, you know, and they're so loud. He's got these amplifiers that are, you know, eight feet tall and doubles and it's really loud. And the audience is going crazy. And it was my first time really seeing what it, a performer who understands that dynamic of entertain, being an entertainer, mm. how how much further you can take your music, you know, even if, if it's good or bad or otherwise, um, people respond to that. And and so we by the time it was the tour was over, you know, we're measuring ourselves for platform boots and yeah. uh, you know <laughs> they had influenced look, you yeah looking for you know going to uh jump on jack flash in new york looking for uh clothes se sequin coats and stuff you know it changed our whole wow. vision of what we sh how we should be entertaining because people want more you know they're paying in, in they're paying a whole seven fifty to eight dollars <laughs> yeah. for a ticket. You know? <laughs> they want to be entertained. So w by the time it was over, we were uh, we had really great clothes and uh, cool shoes, and you know we we knew we knew better what it what it meant to if you're going to get out there and entertain, be an entertainer, don't just don't just look at your shoes and think that's going to make entertain people. You know, they want eye contact. They want, uh, John McPhee once said to me, he was playing with Huey Lewis somewhere. Uh, they were in, he was living in England and they were opening shows for somebody, some, you know, major, you know, glitter band. Huey turned to John. He said, he said, uh get out there quit wearing those overalls get some cool clothes get out there and throw some shapes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and that was you know that was the beginning of john's you know they were they were working with or uh, soon after that they were working with elvis costello working with him but you know they realized that it was time to you got to step up and and be a, you know give the audience a little more than just you know standing out there playing they want they want to interaction with the, the performer, you know, they want to know that they're important to, you know, what you're doing up there. And they are, you know, the audience is, it's part of the whole vibe and dynamic of, of music that uh, they want to be a part of it. And, you know, you, you owe it, I think an entertainer owes it to his, their audience to draw them into what you're doing so that it's, you know, they're a part of it and, and, and they feel like, you know, you appreciate them as much as, as uh, they appreciate you, you know? No, totally. And that's the way that, that we learned that from Mark Bowen. I mean, what? we learned that from day one. I looked some and we went, we need to be better performers because look at this guy, you know? What a great story for, for radio too, because, uh, for fans who, I mean, for any, every time people hear bang a gong, they won't always have that connection to the Doobie brothers <laughs> because of the influence <laughs> that band, uh, had, had on you, which no, I've never heard you, uh, illustrate in such a way it's funny when you talk about that connection too with the audience and and the value uh i don't know we just had ozzy on uh did you hear ozzy when he was on the other day oh, no i didn't and no, uh -uh. just talking about that connection to the audience and and the uh the way that it, it really uh i i just it made me think of him just because he's obviously has that same yeah. sort of very strong yeah, perfect per perfect example yeah. of someone who appreciates you know 
people. what he's doing and and what the audience gives back. Yeah, right, and that has a huge connection uh, with them. Funny enough, um, when we go through your history books, uh, it was only a few months later in December you were back in New York, but at Madison Square Garden. And that one you were headlining, I guess, at. So I think that when that listen to the music was happening, boy, you talk about, I guess, the um, the quick route that stuff would affect your, like, one minute you're opening and a few months later you're headlining? Crazy stuff, yeah. It, that, uh, it, it happened pretty fast. I, I think it scared us <laughs> a little. <laughs> but is that yeah. accurate? You were just three months later, you're back there as a headline act. Uh, you had been opening for Argent and T-Rex at the at the New York Academy of Music. And then in December, you're back at MSG. I mean, and do you remember that? I mean, I would imagine that would have been a little bit frightening to go into that venue. <laughs> I, I don't remember that. Okay. Well, that's cool. That <laughs> we, says a lot. You know, we, we, we <laughs> played there a few times. The the, the most memorable uh, Madison Square Garden gig for me was with uh, Leonard Skinner. Oh, wow. Um, so that, that's that's the one I remember. Um, you know, we played there a couple of times. It's You know, you play those big places and uh, you, you kind of, you don't lose it totally, but you, it's harder to be connect with your audience because it, they're big the audience is a ways away uh the lights are in your face sure. and so on <clears throat> so um kind of forget uh, because you play a few of those places and then pretty soon they're kind of like All well it's a big stage with lights and you can't see the audience yeah you know? no they must so, they must all blend together especially the arenas uh but uh, but how about Nebworth seventy five Pat? That's in the United Kingdom. Almonds, Van Morrison, Doobies, Mahavishnu Orchestra, Tim Buckley. Do you remember that one? I totally remember that. Um, <laughs> it was you know people as far as you could see. You know, it was that the Woodstock effect? You know, it's like uh, you know di digital crowd. <laughs> increase you know you look you can't see the end of the crowd they're out there and then it's a uh, medieval vibe because of the everybody's got their flags on poles and colored and they're streaming in the wind and uh and then you're you know you're out there with really a lot of uh well van morrison being a good example of a of a european entertainer and hawk, hawk wind those kind of people that were playing um so it's much more international kind of a vibe um i'm trying to think uh focus i think they i don't know if focus was on that gig we played with them a few times remember focus oh the yeah Dutch band totally, with totally. The, the yodelers amazing band right. <laughs> um but those are the kind of bands that uh, i remember on that gig and then afterwards uh we finished and i started uh talking i don't know who it was it was van morrison's drummer i couldn't tell you who who he, who was playing drums at that time if somebody said his name i'd probably remember but uh he said hey i might what are you doing after the after the show i go uh uh we're you know we're staying here in, in london we're, we're going back to london we're gonna hang out oh well, you should come over to my place you know we'll hang out and so so he he had his car there he goes I'll just jump in. Let's go. And so he took me out somewhere. Uh, I want to say Surrey, out in Surrey somewhere, uh, outside London. And we went to his house, and it was, you know, I can I can't really remember, but sure. I remember the big big high ceilings and a, a really cool old place out there, and just you know hung out and listened to music and talked, and I'm sure we were smoking some funny. <laughs> something <laughs> <laughs> willie's reserve and, and we stay there yeah and I, he i hung out there till like past midnight and then he finally drove me back into town but um you know it was like one of those wow i'm out here with van morrison's drummer this is so cool you know <laughs> i can't remember who was there i mean sure. i know his wife was here and no but you, some other you appreciate people, you know. that and that's what's what's hip i was saying that like there's going to be some of these you're definitely going to uh cal palace opening for the stones in 76 the following uh year i guess it was now were you doing a whole thing or was that just a one-off what was that can't remember you can't that, that's a storied I, career folks this guy opens for the stones or did the show not happen was it scheduled and it didn't happen i, I, 
I don't think we, that happened. Okay, Cal Palace, my, it says. My, uh, my recollection uh, of... Uh, I don't think that happened. Okay. I think that's... Uh, well, but it could have. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would hope you would remember. Day on the Greens, you remember the day? Because if, re if, I, if I remembered it, it probably didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you got the good memory. So, I mean... It's we play, I'll, I'll tell you the, the, the gigs I remember with the Stones. Huh? We, we did a, uh, a uh, Warner Brothers music tour in London, and we ended up in London, and Mick Jagger and... Uh, Keith Richards came backstage to say hi to us. We wow. were playing a gig with a, you know, Graham Central Station, Little Feet. I think they were probably there more to see Little Feet than they were there to see us. But they came back by, and they said hi, and Keith was with uh, Anita Pallenberg, and they came back and and everywhere we played there, they set all the dressing rooms up for all the musicians with all the booze you could possibly drink, you know. <laughs> scotch cognac tequila everything imaginable and we drank a little bit but not we were huge drinkers so we went and played we came back to the dressing room all the booze was gone <laughs> and so was keith and mick <laughs> and anita <laughs> And then we played again with them uh, in New Orleans. I remember that gig. That was another gig. With Van, with Van, it was uh, Stones. Doobie with Van Halen. Halen. Wow, yep. super dope. That was a great. That was a great. That was amazing because I was really able to hang and and watch them play. They, I'll tell you, those guys are the nicest guys. The Stones. Right. They're just no. They don't put on any airs. You know, they come out and to they come towards you and greet you and grab your hand and they're just good good people they're real music people and uh, real people you know if you will oh man so that was that's my memory of them uh, sometimes musicians are you know they don't want to you know they don't want to be looked at they don't want to be touched right, right. but not, <laughs> but them. not the stone no not that's them. a great memory and and uh vh was that the first time that you uh was that how many times have you shared the bill with van halen Oh, Van Halen. Um, more than that? I don't know. More than that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I, I've known those guys because Ted, Ted Templeman yeah, the, was their producer and our producer. And I used to go to their sessions and, and watch them play and, and vice versa. Uh, they would show up occasionally at our sessions. And, uh, you know, David Lee Roth is like, there's only one David Lee Roth, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, and he likes some cool music too. I remember listening to some of those uh, the bootlegs of Van Halen in the mid '70s when they would cover funk, and he was really into James Brown and Cool and the Gang and stuff. So they were they were actually coming to your so like uh, Eddie Van Halen, David Lee Roth were just stopping in. Not not a lot, but they did come by. Yeah, sure. Um, David, uh, I saw him more than once, uh, and I really like him. He's uh, well, any memories he's or just, stories? Well, just every time you see him, it's 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 what everybody else sees. <laughs> you know, he he starts talking, and everything he starts talking about leads to something else and stories. And he just he doesn't really stop talking. You know, he just keeps going. But everything about him is. Uh, he's a genuine guy you know he's a genuine character and uh and i love you know this the music he's done through the years i just think he's done so i love his solo stuff uh as much uh, just about as the stuff uh, i i i like Van so oh I yeah can't say that, but but i i loved uh, you know in california uh, girls girls and um i'm just a gigolo that stuff i love that you know i just thought he was very clever and uh, and uh, again, a genuine person. You know, he is what he seems to be always. Uh. Yeah, I met him only one time at WBCN in Boston, and he was super, super cool. And 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 yes, I always remember that. I always love the from that Edom uh, from Yankee Rose. I always at least can remember the video when they when the very beginning of the video when the. The uh, girl goes in to buy something in the store, and she was like, not if you were the last immigrant grocer on earth. <laughs> I don't know why. I just always remember that one video. <laughs> so he is a, he is a very uh, 
funny dude. Um, and you know what? I also wrote down a couple, and I'm jumping back in time, but they and they may not have because there have been a lot of uh, people may not realize ahead of these Doobie Brothers shows that uh, Pat and the band have been through town a lot. But a couple different ones that you may or may not have stories on. Um, July 73 with Tower of Power at the HIC. Now that's the Blaisdell Arena. Um, any memories of that? I, I do. What, what year was that? That was 70, in uh, July of 73. 73, yeah. Mm -hmm. I do remember that. Um, you know, th those guys are like, I don't know, the greatest soul r&b funk band of all time you know i don't maybe i mean they're really up there uh, for me uh, personally i think they just you know the energy and the the tightness of the group and they never ever depart from that every incarnation with every player whoever's playing whoever's in the band and they've had a few different drummers guitar players singers okay they never deviate from excellence. You know, they are just a, a wonderful band. Um, you know, they've just been friends forever. Um, Emilio had a great story about you one time. He was talking about the band. He was talking about how they used to like to do gigs with you because you guys had the best sound system. Like your PA was the best. And so he said they always wanted to be doing gigs because like your mics, your monitors, you name it. The doobies had the best PA. We, we did have good good stuff for a long time. That was but, a, uh, It's even better now. These no, no question. And people will get see in, in the in the ear thing. Uh, for me, uh, just it's just taking it to another another level. Yeah, it really is. No, no question. You came back ironically a year after that, and it was a two nighter, July twenty seventh and twenty eighth, and uh, a band that when I was a little boy was one of my mom's favorites. She used to really like. Uh, uh, Scenes from an Imaginary Western was her song, and uh, Nantucket Sleigh Ride. The band was Mountain. Oh, God, Mountain. Memories of doing that? Two nights at the uh, HIC, well, or maybe not. <laughs> one of my very, very, very favorite um, trio bands, you know, Leslie West. Uh, there's another guy that just had never lost a lick. You know, I saw he was great then. Um, I don't remember really much um, of that hanging out hanging out with them, uh, but we admired them uh, tremendously. Uh, I, I just thought they they had great songs, killer arrangements, um, a tight band. Uh, you know, Leslie West being one of the great under in some ways underrated guitar players of all time. If you listen to those Mountain Records. Um, he was up there with Clapton or, you know, uh, Hendrix in a different, he had his own mode of mm -hmm. playing certainly, but, but he was really up there in terms of his ability. And um, I never heard him play a sour note on anything he ever played. You know what I mean? Sometimes you miss the fret and you, you, you play the wrong note and then you have to play it again to cover it up. Right. You, you know. It was never that way with him. He was so on all the time. I saw him play in Maui like years, years later. Um, he came here with some, you know, uh, um, a whole bunch of other musicians to play. They were on the road. Uh, Paul Kantner, he played, Leslie played. I think Jeff Baxter played. I um, can't remember who all the musicians were, but. Uh, uh, they all got up and, and did a few songs. And Leslie West was like the last guy on stage. And I thought, what's this going to be like? And he had, he had lost all the weight, 200 pounds. Right. So he got real thin. And uh, I got, what's this going to be like? He got up there, he plugged in. It was like he was 18 years old. He sang like amazing. And he played exactly like he always did with that energy and that tone. I was just like, oh my God, this guy, where has he been? You know, <laughs> he should be a, a superstar. You know? There's a few guys like that. Dave Mason is another guy. You hear Dave play, you just go, holy crap. He sings like, you know, David Crosby was another one. Their voices, they never age. Their voices never age. They sing, Dave Mason sings arguably better now than he did when he 
was playing with traffic, you know? I mean, just amazing. And his guitar playing, of course, has matured monumentally. And you, but, um, you played a lot with him, uh, FYI, when I was looking at, uh, at, at the classic uh, posters and stuff there. But on the David, you mentioned David Crosby, and we just lost him recently, not that long back. Is there any, did you ever have any stories, interactions, run-ins, fun with him? <laughs> I say this. <laughs> I say this jokingly. Okay. He was the crabbiest guy in rock and roll. You know, I mean, he, he, you heard his interviews and how he responds to people. Somebody painted a picture of him and gave it to him. David, I love you. And he went, that's the worst picture I've ever painted. Quit trying to be an artist. You know, it's <laughs> like that. He's, he was a character, you know. And he was very nice to me. And, we, you know, we got along. But I didn't really... I, I bumped into him three or four times, and it you know was kind of like, "Hey, how you doing? Nice to see you. It sounded great, you know that kind of thing." Uh, can I take? Can we do a selfie? You know, <laughs> uh, and I I just loved his music. I still do. I thought his last album um, was it for free? Is that the name of it? I don't know. It, not... it was, in my opinion, it was one of the best albums he's ever done. It was like. You know the last thing he he did, and you know he's he was going through some uh, physical issues, yep. and um, I know he he, did, he wasn't feeling well at times. But that album, I, I recommend it to everybody. If you haven't heard that album, I think it's called For Free. It is one of the best David Crosby albums, and Mike McDonald sings on it. Mike wrote a, a part of a song huh. with him. Um, and I, I just think it's a marvelous record. I, I can't recommend it more. I'd recommend it to everybody. Every time somebody says, what have you been listening to lately? I always go, David Crosby. you got to hear that album. It's just so good. Um, I'm surprised it wasn't a, a bigger hit because uh, it was just an excellent record. Um, you know, there's a few guys like that. Paul Simon's another one that keeps making these incredible records, you know. How can a guy write that many songs and still write that many great songs, you know, again and again? It's just amazing. And David, I, I think some of the songs on that record, uh, you know, he always wrote great songs. All the stuff he did with CPR, all the stuff he did with Crosby, Sills, Nash, all the stuff he did with the Birds. There isn't a, a, a stinker in any of those songs. Every single one is a great song. Um, but... Uh, this album it was something special for me. I, I just, I listen to it all the time. When I go, if I'm doing something, uh, you know, it's my go-to record. I listen to it. A, a wide range of evangelizing today from Mr. Simmons, whether it's... Uh, Oops, sorry, with, get with, carried away. No, I love it. Whether it's T-Rex <laughs> or David Crosby, <laughs> you found something that uh, draws a connection to a, to Pat. So David Crosby actually, believe it or not, factors into at the time, was a really big thing. Uh, Doobie Brothers have been involved in a lot of big things, and certainly benefits have not been a, uh, a stranger to you, and you did the stuff here, uh, Kokua for Japan, and, and going way back, the No Nukes concerts, again, thinking of David Crosby, 1979, Madison Square Garden, it's Bruce Springsteen, Jackson Brown, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Gil Scott Heron, Carly Simon, Bonnie Raitt, yourselves, any memories of how that all came together? And, and was that one of the nights that I guess you did run into David? Um, yep. Yeah, we were, um, it was, that was just, I'm trying to think, uh, you know, the original <coughs> concept for that uh, really came from Jackson Brown and uh, Bonnie Raitt and, and Jackson were really kind of the spearhead of that whole thing. And a guy named John Hall who was in a band called Orleans. I think yeah. it was Orleans. Does that make sense? That uh, sounds yeah. like and, it. Uh, and so they came to us, and I think they probably spoke to everyone else to to get them involved. And we said, sure, of course, right off the bat, uh, we were, you know, wanted to be a part of it. And uh, we all went to New York, and we were there for a couple of days before the show. And we had talked, you know, we were, good friends with Bonnie and uh, and Jackson both. So uh, we sort of kept in touch and what's going on, how's this coming, you know, what, do, what part do you want us to play and so on. <clears throat> and then we all went to New York and we rehearsed. Uh, we met 
you know, we'd get together and all the bands would kind of get together some location, I can't remember, some re rehearsal area. And then uh, we would talk, you know, and just say, well, what do you go? What about this? What about that? What are your ideas? Uh, what do you want to do here? What do you want to do there? And it was kind of interesting because they had options of uh, going forward with things. Uh, they, they, it was kind of an uh, off the wall location to have something like that in the city in Madison Square Garden. So we we're trying to uh, raise as much awareness and uh have the budget to do it all and not lose money and not uh, and actually make some money to contribute uh towards some of these uh non-polluting uh energy resources and so we had you know over a period of a couple of days we had meetings with everybody and everybody would just sit around and somebody would say you know put a something forward and then uh, we would comment on it and argue about it <laughs> stuff you know and uh eventually you know we and then as it got near the end then we had a rehearsal okay we want to do this song of john hall's which i think was um uh, uh, what was the name of the song it was called uh not the warm spirit of the sun that was one of the lyrics but uh okay. take your you know take this poison energy away that was kind of part of the, the of the chorus you know and uh so we did john's song and then uh we did another song somebody else's tune and then at the they wanted for the the very end of the concert to do taking it to the streets which was our song which was anthemic Sure. song and everybody wanted to participate and sing verses i think james sang a verse and and mike sang a verse and uh you know i can't remember who else uh, maybe bonnie or, or jackson but uh and so we did that and that was it it was thrilling for me because you know i'm on the stage with my idols you know all these singing your tune I, uh, yeah that i really admired doing one of the doobie brothers songs yeah. we played a set Everybody played a short set. I think we, you know, 20 minutes, half an hour kind of thing to, you know, make it move along. And then, uh, and then James and Carly were kind of the, you know, they kind of were there and then they were gone and then they came back. So they were kind of featured uh, a little bit. James did a little set and then, and then uh, Carly came on and sang with him. And uh, it was just a really family kind of a, you know, gr good feeling, you know, um, a lot of camaraderie and we afterwards we all we went to a club and hung out and everybody you know kind of jammed and and just you know it was just really a great great thing we you know we went out to eat uh different nights with different people while we were there and it, it was really fun you know it was really something special i think and you played, and played then with it bruce. was a what was that? You had played with Bruce. Was that one of the only times that Bruce Springsteen? You know, we never, we never really uh, interacted. I don't even know. I don't think we were even on the same night. As, okay. I think it went for two nights. Got it. That's my recollection. And Bruce played on a different night than we played, same. and I did not see him play that night. Okay. I, I've seen him play other nights, but you know, just going to his shows and stuff. But uh, I did not see him that night. But. Uh, I think some of the acts, I think it, maybe it was a two night show. So by the time we got to the end, um, we did, we did the song all together, but I can't, you know, I'm sorry, Dave. I, again, no, you know, it's cool. it, it may have only been, it may have only been one night and Bruce played earlier. That's probably how it went down. Cause I, it doesn't make sense that we would have done two nights there. I think it was just one night. I think maybe Bruce played early in the evening and left or something like that okay because he wasn't on taking it you're saying he did not do the all-star take i don't re i don't think so how about uh in the same year <laughs> entirely different show <laughs> and this is one that really made me made me laugh uh it's kind of like the one with uh vh on the bill um this is may 79 the tangerine bowl in orlando and it says here boston was the headliner Doobie Brothers, Poco, and ACDC. <laughs> Is that how it went? Wow. You remember that? That's pretty, that's pretty eclectic. <laughs> uh, you know, va vaguely, uh, uh, I probably remember Poco more because I was 
friends with uh, those guys and okay. uh, Rusty Young and I sure. uh, became really good good friends. I ended up playing in a band with Rusty for yeah. a while. Um, uh, tangerine Dream. I don't remember no, that. No, no, it, was, uh, <laughs> it wasn't. Ta- it was Tangerine Bowl. Oh, it was a called. Tang- Tangerine Bowl. I think yeah, that was yeah, just yeah, a bit. Well, that's okay. Well, here's a couple though that I bet this is. A I little... do. I think I do remember ACDC playing. Just going. Oh my god! Right. <laughs> These guys are like strong you know <laughs> really that's a word strong. one of my all-time favorite uh, rock bands you know well with that <laughs> that biker connection you got i can't imagine that that wouldn't be in the uh in the uh-huh. mix there's a couple of big stadium dates that uh i would say well actually three that are all close to home in terms of pat's uh even though pat's a, a valley isle cat these days he's of course known for his strong northern california bay area connections and there was a uh 75 day on the green the late great bill Bill uh, Graham would do these shows, put a lot of, of bands together. This was June 75. Doobie Brothers, it looks like, headlined over the Eagles, Commander Cody, and you even had Bobby Weir from the Grateful Dead with Kingfish. Memories? Wow. Um, I didn't bring him to headline. <laughs> we probably, I, I, I kind of think we did because um, my recollection is Elton John showed up at that gig and he got up on stage and jammed with the Eagles. And, and I was going, wow, how are we going to top that? You know, we got to, not only we got to follow the Eagles, which really sucks. Uh, we got to follow the Eagles with Elton John. It'll never, what are we going to do? You know, oh, well, you know, we're lucky to be playing. Are we getting paid? Yeah. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> so, so Elton comes backstage. We had played with Elton before, or, you know, we jammed with Elton years before, I think on that, that one I was talking about where the Stones showed up, the, mother, the Warner Brothers music tour. Right. Um, he had come by and we played out in Manchester, I think. And he showed up at the gig and got up and played with us, on uh, played piano on one of the gigs. So that was a huge moment. Uh, but um, um, that, anyway, he got up and, and jammed with the Eagles. So then, you know, I, I was kind of fretting about, oh, man, I follow these guys. It's going to be tough. And he comes around into our dressing room and says, hey, guys, you want, can I sit in with you guys, too? <laughs> You're <laughs> so like, go, thankfully. Oh. I go, oh, thank. I go, are you kidding? Of course, you know. Thank God, you know, he wants to sit in with us. You know, he can take take us, help us to get up there, you know, a little bit. So, uh, yeah. So he got up and jammed with us too at the end of our our uh, our show. But you know, the playing with the Eagles, it's like we knew we shouldn't have been headlining. They should have been the headliners, but it didn't matter. You know, the days in the green. They were, it's like playing a giant Fillmore auditorium. There really was no headliner. Everybody was, you know, somebody that uh, the audience wanted to see. So, you know, there was all of those, always eclectic pairings, you know, that uh, Bill Graham did on all those gigs. I used to go to the Fillmore a lot and, you know, I'd see like, you know, you know odd things in Miles Davis with, you know, uh, Dr. John or something, you know, create weird funny odd pairings you know um oh, so I, lo- I love that about about what he did you, know. you did two of those days on the green and that's a huge stadium oakland stadium huge venue this was may 77 so two years later it was fleetwood mac headlining doobies gary wright does that stick out at all probably not uh again one of those great oh, you uh, dates and i think uh fleetwood mac probably headlined yeah. that show maybe that's what it says um we opened for them, uh, thank God, and <laughs> and uh, I remember them pulling up uh, to the gig, and I had known uh, all of them. I knew all those people. Uh, I, I knew um, Lindsay and um, um, Stevie from San Jose because they were San Jose-based duo uh, back in the day, was, right? Yeah, sixty-nine, seventy. They were. Yeah, uh, Buckingham Knicks. They had done this little thing locally, and they were, you know, kind of local uh, success locally. They had a rec, an album, and stuff, and they were doing really well in that regard. And uh, so I, I had met them. They, 
Stevie Nicks lived right next door to where we used to rehearse on 12th Street in San Jose. It was a rooming house. I don't know if she was going to school there at one point or something, but she, or she had friends there. But she came up to me and goes, you know, you guys used to drive me crazy, you know, rehearsing over there till all hours of the night. I don't have a mind to come over and tell you to turn it off. You know, I want to do many times. <laughs> But uh, so then, uh, and we always had that discussion. She would always say that every time I would see her. And then um, I had gotten to be friends with Christine McPhee because oh, uh, wow. when they, uh, we she used to do gigs with them uh, when Bob, um, what was Welch? Bob's name? Bob Welch. Bob Welch was a guitar player. We started doing gigs with uh, Fleetwood Mac. Mike Hossack, our drummer, had turned me on to Fleetwood Mac in the you know late sixties, early seventies, and uh, I flipped. You know, just what a great, you know, contemporary blues mm. band they were. Peter Green was, you know, arguably the man, the one of the greatest, and um, they were all good. They were great. Everybody sang. Everybody, you know, all the guys wrote, played, sang. And uh, so then we started doing gigs with him when Bob was the lead guitar player. And I thought, well, that's a good band, too. It's way different from and Christine wasn't in that early band. So I was for me, I'm going, who is this this lady? You know, Christine McVie, she must be married to the to the bass player. And I, I think she had been. But I don't think at that time, I think they had broken up, but she was still playing. And and but they were really, really good. and And. I kind of went, wow, she is really special, you know, her voice and her songs in that incarnation of the band. And she and Bob had kind of a magic. Bob had these really cool lilting tunes that he sang and yeah. played. And together they had a little magical thing going on. I thought, wow, they're really good. So I kind of became closer to them. You know, it was like we played quite a few shows and I would always I go... I, Oh, we're playing Fleetwood Mac again. Great. I get to go see Christine and Bob. You know, I would go out there. Hey, guys, how you doing? Can I hang out with you for a while? <laughs> and because uh, <laughs> I really I would watch their show and I just thought, wow, they're so. And, you know, Mick Fleetwood, I mean, one of the greatest drummers of all time. Uh, and uh, uh, John, just solid. They were just a solid, solid band. Uh, but like a quartet, right? Really yeah, a, Bob was great, uh, man. He had some great uh, those uh, ebony eyes. Some of his solo tunes were from that. He band. he he came out of that, uh, you know, with more success than he had had with yep. Fleetwood Mac. But um, but really a great. So I didn't really see Christine for a long, or or any of the band. They sort of went through that big change. They became really popular, big stars, and we didn't play gigs with them anymore. Then we played that one gig, and uh, much more. It recent. was like they they pulled up. The first thing Stevie gets out and goes, "You guys, you made so much noise <laughs> <laughs> all the time." And then Christine said, "Oh, I'm so happy. It's so good to see you, my friend. You know, and hug me." Wow. And uh, it was just like this connection. Like she was just such a you know, she remembered. She you know reminisced with me a little bit and then we played the gig and uh, they left and I didn't see her for a long time and then we played a gig in Maui we came to play and uh, we had a, a, a night off or something before the gig and one of the guys in the crew or you know management or something comes to me and says yeah uh, we got an invite to go over to Christine McPhee's house in Maui I go in Maui what's she doing here in Maui you know so um yeah, of course, I'd love to go, you know, so we go over there, wow. and it was in La Lahaina, and she walks out the front door, and there she is, and, oh, Pat, I'm so glad you could come, come on in, give me a hug, and, you know, eh, have something to drink, and we sat around, and we sat for hours, you know, just wow. hanging out and uh, talking, and hadn't seen each other since, and she by that time, she was kind of done with Fleetwood Mac, right. I think, for a while, at that point, I, th I don't think she was touring with them or she had decided to take a break and then soon after that she was back playing with them again but uh, anyways just another wonderful genuine person you know uh, really one of the great 
uh, keyboard players, songwriters ever, you know, in my opinion, that I that I've known in my lifetime. I just thought she was really, really a special uh, person and a, and a wonderful musician. You know? That's a great way to remember her. And so Lahaina, and you were already living on Maui then? And No, I, I had not moved okay. here. Uh, I, I was still living in California. We were just came to play. I think we were okay. playing the tennis courts over in uh, Lahaina. You know, over in Lahaina, where they it was before they had built the the Maui Arts and Cultural Center, so that was the go to place where they had gigs out there by the by the Royal Lahaina and uh, the tennis courts, and uh, just you know, so wonderful. You know, it was just a, a, a memory that I'll carry with me oh, forever. You for know? sure. So never crossing paths with her again. Then I guess is what I'm. Uh... No, that was kind of that was it, as far as I recall. I think it was the last time I, I saw her yeah, in person. And, and, <laughs> it's funny because John came was there, and uh, they weren't even married anymore. And he came walking through the house. Hey, hi, hi, guys, and walked through and walked out. <laughs> <laughs> How wild! And then he ended up living in the Honolulu area at some point years later. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think maybe they owned that house, or maybe she and John and Mick all owned that place together, or something. At one point, I don't know. Mick may still uh, have a house over there, but uh, yeah, I, I know he still has. I know he still has a house in line. I don't know if it's that particular house, but uh, it's, it's a, a nice place. That's a great story with Christine, and it gives a great local connection. And uh, and sort of going back in time, just a couple more stories, and then and I'll be done milking you for this one. You've given us some great ones. There there is another stadium show, and and um, and not picking this because of the all star cast. Uh, but it's a, when you when you look at this 1975 Kaiser Stadium, it's the San Francisco Snack Benefit Concerts. Now I've heard about this oh, yeah. from uh, Pete Sears because <laughs> I remember he played. I believe he backed uh, Jerry at that. But it's Jerry Garcia, The Miracles, Santana, Joan Baez, Tower of Power, Jefferson Starship, Neil Young, Yourselves, and when I mention it, is there? Any fun memories, stories, anything that comes to mind about that remarkable gathering? We were so thrilled to be a part of that because of all those people that you mentioned. You know, um, Bill uh, would often pull bands together to do benefits and, and just you know, one off gigs here and there and everything. And um, that was uh, to benefit. Uh, you know the arts for the community i i believe for the bay area mm. and uh sports and, and the arts and so on which uh, they were pulling uh, at that time you know the the budgets were all getting carved out um you know problems with revenue for the for the school district so uh it, it's still reverberations of that everywhere of sure. course uh, but uh bill had step forward to generate this have these this concert and uh you know it was like wow this is so eclectic and uh, i remember you know hanging out backstage with marlon brando we're like oh, there we go. that's marlon brando and our drummers over there john you know hardman's going yeah well you know i used to do some acting <laughs> he's like you know, <laughs> no he was such a poser great a good po on a, in, in a good way <clears throat> but um and all the you know bob dylan all the people that were there was just like phenomenal show and just you know such an honor to be a part of that and then it was in an odd place you know kesar stadium is kind of in the middle of san francisco it's i think you can if you're standing in the upstairs in a building in the in san francisco hospital you can look out and you can look down there and see <laughs> kesar stadium and it's like in a neighborhood it sits it, you know, which is kind of crazy because, you know, there's houses all around it and everything <laughs> and, uh, you know, bl blasting rock and roll music off the rooftops here. But uh, so it was really a, a wonderful event, you know, and, and they did raise a, a good amount of money for the community. I think it was, you know, uh, a real great positive gesture on Bill Graham's part. Not that he didn't do that over and over and over again sure. for the for the Bay Area. He was like one of the great uh go-to people if he had something you wanted to do to raise money he was just you know always trying to help people he was just a wonderful guy and uh, i can't say enough good about him you know as 
Yeah, I, there's another one of the crankiest men in rock and roll. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but man, he was uh, just really a wonderful guy. You know what? What a good heart for the community. Was that one of the only uh, Jerry? How many other times were you and Jerry Garcia and or the Dead on the same? Uh... <clears throat> Not a lot. Uh, we played a few times with the Dead uh, through the years. Um, a few times with Bob. Uh, we played uh, Clint, Bill Clinton's inaugural right. party with uh, Bob Weir and Rat Dog. That was a, a trip. <laughs> sure, he had a lot of him. Kind of, Fleetwood Mac too actually did one of those. Um, yeah, yeah. One of those gigs. Bonnie, Bonnie was in the next room playing. Uh, we were playing. She was over there playing. Yeah, he had all um, the classic rock uh, bands. And stuff. Yeah, he loved. He was a, he was a music guy, right? With his sax and stuff. I, <laughs> I remember. That. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and one of your final ones here uh, the, that I was uh, cause we have a, a mountain of these, and I, I don't want to wear them all out because next time we have Pat on, I got to have more stuff for him. But there's uh, I was recently watching because we I, I told you we had Ozzy on the show, so I was studying up, and and um, one of the things I was reviewing was when Black Sabbath played in 1975 on the uh, Don Kirshner's rock concert television program, and uh, certainly remarkable to watch them on that. It was filmed in Santa Monica, that one, and I happened to, in studying for this chat with our uh, Doobie Brothers guest here today, Pat Simmons, 1973, the debut, it says here, of Don Kirshner's rock concert on television actually featured you guys. I remember, I think Edgar Winter might have been on that too. It seems to me, um, what's your name? Oh, shoot. Oh. <coughs> senior moment, senior moment here. Uh, uh, <laughs> You're thinking of a band? What are you thinking of? Yeah, um, R and B soul band um, that was on the same night when you guys did it. Uh, I believe so. We we record what what that what the deal was. Uh, I believe we recorded that in Madison Square Garden at about four thirty in the morning. Uh, Don Kirshner had gotten you know the the go ahead to to present this show. It, it was taped or filmed, I don't know if they hey, had tape in those days, it probably was filmed, I mean, maybe they had tape, they must have had tape, but they taped it anyway, and uh, we played live, uh, and it was uh, on the stage in Madison Square Garden, I think we only played one or two songs, maybe, um, Edgar Winter uh, played, I believe, and doesn't matter 4 30 a.m like you mean w explain that part <laughs> yeah there i mean they were like they were like homeless guys sleeping in there when we got there i think <laughs> they snuck in <laughs> and uh we we taped it because that was the uh that was when he had the venue that he could do the taping uh they gave it to wow. him cheap because nobody was working uh that at obviously at 4 30 in the morning <laughs> and uh so he got you know, he had to get a union crew out, of course, that probably cost them, but, um, but it was cheap and they did it on, on the cheap because I don't think they use many cameras. It was just kind of like, let's get it done. Let's get out kind of a thing. No crowd. And, uh, we, yeah, no crowd. We set up, played, gone. <laughs> and, um, and then we did another one for him, uh, probably a year later, or, I don't know, six months later, something like that. Um, that was a little more. Uh, extended i think we played about 20 minutes we played about four or five songs um and they taped them live at a sh at a show that we did so that was a little bit a better opportunity for us at that time um and in fact it was a show that the stones were on where they presented uh what their their new single the rolling stones and they got up and lip synced to uh angie that was the the release that they were putting out and then we followed that with our live show and explosions and you know uh smoke bombs and stuff going off so it we looked really good they were kind of this subdued ballad angie, <laughs> right. angie. and it was like okay we, but everybody was watching because it was a debut of the stones album so 
or the stone single rather so they watched that and then we came on it was like <laughs> you know and we were thinking this this is really good for us and it was you know we got to be with the stones but we got to play live and jump around and wear our funny clothes and everything you know so wow. worked out. <laughs> that's that's a lot of insight into the whole uh i mean both earth, both earth, of them earth, earth wind and fire i don't know why i couldn't remember that but that was the show the first show i believe earth wind and fire played and they they had their that's where they were all were african you know kind of dashiki type yeah. uh clothes in those days and capes they were amazing and they never stopped and the they, I don't know if they had a fans up there that moved their clothes around, <laughs> but they were fabulous. And they played just like they always played fantastic, great, you know, horns and super funky. But then they had that thing, that visual thing going on in those days. It was like nobody else was doing. Yeah, know? that was the MSG one, the first, the debut, uh, the debut Don Kirshner show, basically that you're talking about that's the one that had you were is that the one that the one you're describing that had earth wind that's, and fire that that's my memory that they played on that show too okay. and i think they played late at night too is that you know we all ended up there doing this fast taping in madison square garden <laughs> yeah i love that i mean that's what i mean about the for fans to think i mean those are the business logistics that people it, it was the first show of its kind where bands uh, that i recall you know there was you know uh american bandstand everybody lip synced to the songs there were tv shows uh the smothers brothers and stuff where people got up and played and some of that stuff was live but it was a different kind of a format this was the first time when you had multiple acts yep. like a concert where they got up and played songs on a big stage and you know with the pa system and everything and uh it was broadcast so that was it was pretty it was a, a moment, you know, we were just like, wow, how do we, how, you know, how do we fall into this? This is fabulous. You yeah. Know, so. That was a historic show. It's good that you put that out there. I was going to have to explain that for the audience. Yeah. Don Kirshner's rock concert, a, a historic early uh, rock concert television program that uh, introduced uh, a lot of people to many bands and, and was b way before the era of MTV or a lot of the visual promotion uh that would come later and funny enough that you would be there part of the debut of that and uh and and a historic thing it's kind of like your uh thing that you did with uh the what's happening years later when the doobie brothers again made history being really featured in a plot line on a show and and uh so when they they load into town for these concerts there's a whole lot of history and and you can make sure perhaps folks should bring themselves i don't know if this is it sounds like the right thing you get a copy of electric warrior and you just rock out to bang a gong <laughs> as as you show up at the concert and give give the late great mark bolin the uh, credit for uh yeah for, you know i never got to say he was the nicest person uh that you'd ever want to meet you know um he uh he was always gracious and you know used to come and say hi and you know not one of those stuck up kind of people um and um just treated us with ultimate respect and we you know we gave it back he was just a wonderful guy Get, became really good friends with him and uh um you know he would just you know all the guys in the band got to be really great friends with him we did a lot of shows I think, you know, 20 or 30 shows at least. And so we got to know them really well every night and uh, just, uh, you know, great memories of, of that era. And it was, uh, that was our first big tour. We did mm -hmm. one tour prior Mother to Earth. that with uh, Mother Mother Earth. Mm -hmm. But that show with those, that tour with Mark was our, our debut really in the, you know, playing big venues for large audiences and, uh, and our first real kind of hit record and listen to the music had just come out. And so it did a huge for, uh, you know, it was a huge perk for us all the way around. And that was what electric warrior was that the electric warrior tour that, that, that was that, that, uh, record. Yeah. That he had so my, my mom used to tell me she's in heaven, probably laughing at this, but, uh, she used to say when I, when I was a little kid, 
that was the first time she noticed I had some connection to music because she loved that band and she would play that record a lot. She said, <laughs> I, I, I used to stand in my crib and hold on to the thing and like be, uh, <laughs> be like rocking cool. out to it. All right, so we wrap up. We're, anyone that I did not mention that you thought of that you thought, oh, he never did ask about that. If there's any one guy, that's your final question because I asked you a lot of cool stories and we went through a lot of posters and uh, is there one any one guy I failed to mention that or tour or show that just sticks out as like a, a real fun uh fun part of doobie brothers I had, history i had dinner last night with uh dick ebersall and uh susan st james that any of those ring a bell yeah um dick, dick ebersall was the producer uh, of uh, saturday night live with uh, uh what's his name uh lauren green uh, Lauren Michael. Oh, uh, Lauren Michael. Okay, they the main yeah, guy. Lauren, Gre Lauren Green's the other guy. Okay. And who is that? Who is the woman and the other? Uh... And, and Susan, Susan Saint James used to have uh, a couple of television shows yeah. on. Uh, I remember that. Uh, Macmill Macmillan and wife with the uh, Rock Hudson, and uh, she and Dick are married. But uh, I had to throw that in there because, again, two of the most wonderful piece people on the face of the earth uh susan and dick and all the sports fans know who dick is dick's the one that uh started uh you know with fox uh, from monday night football i believe that's uh that was dick's uh invention among other things he did a lot of things in sports uh saturday night live he was you know early the saturday night live uh he was the one of the producers on that show you know, with uh, you know John Belushi and um, Bill Murray and Chevy, all Chevy, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, all those guys. Um, that was that was Dick. Uh, he was just super imaginative, bright person, and a super sports guy. You know, he's like way into football um, as far as pr production and uh, presentation. And Susan is a fabulous actress and one of the sweetest. They live over there. Of the earth, so. Uh, they come here uh, uh, occasionally. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. They, they love, I think, every. they live everywhere. <laughs> there you go. Well, we're looking forward to having you back in town. Well, hopefully, we'll get to actually see you when you're uh, coming in. It's a Doobie Brothers and doing a couple more, uh, adding to their extensive legacy we've been going over. May 2nd at the MAC, May 5th, Waikiki Show. That'll be the final couple of shows in this uh asia pacific tour and uh hope you had fun going over your stuff it's always i'm just so uh blessed and grateful that you take the time to do this uh with me pat really i am super grand, uh grateful well i i'm the one that's blessed just uh being able to to be here with you dave i mean every everybody in the islands uh loves and respects you so uh, you're you're the you're the voice man <laughs> Bless I'm, oh, I'm supposed, uh, and I, I, he didn't say for this, he doesn't know I'm doing this interview, but uh, Hutch Hutchinson always wants me to say, if I ever talk to you, you know, he wants me to say hi to you, Hutch. Ah, uh, right on. He, he, you know, you're, you're, one, you're one of his favorites, so I wanted you to know that. Well, that's awesome. We'll be looking for him. Thank you for that. We'll be looking for him with the Bonnie uh, thing that's yeah, coming. Yeah, they're, they're, they're coming over pretty quick, actually. Yep. And, may, uh, may i think yeah well i'll be looking for you hopefully uh we'll see you at the thing i give you a big hug and high five and and uh and that'll be great to see you at the waikiki show and and a different sort of uh a venue for me for uh for you and i was i was reflecting i was telling my boss bill who used to work for cnn and bloomberg and stuff he was he used to work in dc my first doobie show was at the uh Meriwether Post Pavilion. Oh, yeah. 1989. Yep. That was my first one. That place got pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. <sometimes. laughs> uh, those are memories. There are aspects of that story. We'll just, we'll, we'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, we'll come back to that one. I, I have a story from, from that uh, venue that I can tell you about. <laughs> Love it. Well, great to have you on. Say hi to Chris and uh, fabulous wife and also your son, Pat Jr. And, uh, and we'll see you soon, bud. Hey. Appreciate it, Dave. Good to good to see you and hear you. And uh, same. I'll, uh, and and loved your uh, rappel this year. Way to go! Thank you for all the support so that, of that. That's it. You're very very generous, and that's the best feeling in the world to go up there and do that. You're scaring the hell out of me, man. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Stay safe, my brother, and I'll see you soon. You too. Take care. Really appreciate it. Aloha. Aloha. Aloha.